At this point, we're gonna remove the thymus gland and the thyroid gland. So I am just gonna carefully, without damaging the heart and without damaging the lungs, try and pull portions of the thymus gland out. There we go, no more thymus. And I'm going to carefully, I'm gonna try and dig under it. Remove, there we go, the thyroid gland. Now, now that the thyroid gland is kind of out of the way, we'll just let him hang out up there. Okay, I just removed the thymus gland so that we can see most of the heart. And on top of the heart, I want you to notice that this muscular pump is covered with, and I, I broke it when I was moving the diaphragm, but it's covered with this sheath of tissue. This is known as the pericardium or the pericardial sac. The pericardium is a sac of tissue that holds the heart in place. It's also filled with fluid so that every time our heart contracts and relaxes and beats, there's not gonna be any friction from the heart against the lungs or anything around it because there's almost like this windshield wiper fluid inside the pericardium that reduces any friction of the heart contracting and relaxing. Now I'm gonna remove the pericardium at this point so we can see some of the deeper structures inside the heart. It's almost like a, um, like a trash bag consistency. Okay, running across the heart, you are able to see the coronary artery. And this is the artery that delivers oxygenated blood to the heart itself so that the heart muscle has oxygen to produce ATP. If this artery gets blocked or blood's not able to travel down it, the heart muscle won't receive oxygen and the heart muscle will start to die. That's a heart attack, also known as a myocardial infarction, when the heart muscle itself can't receive oxygen down the coronary artery. The coronary artery is also very nice because it allows us to differentiate between the left side and the right side of the heart. So for simplicity's sake, we are gonna say everything to the left of the coronary artery is the left side of the heart and everything to the right of the coronary artery is the right side of the heart. Now the heart in a mammal has four chambers, two top chambers and two bottom chambers. The top chambers are called atria, and it's really hard to tell where the atria are from the outside of the heart, but let's just generally say this is our right atrium here because it's at the top on the right-hand side, and this is our right ventricle. This is our left atrium over here, and this is our left ventricle down here near the apex or the point of the heart. But what are these ear-like looking flaps? Well, these structures right here are known as auricles. Auricles are often mistaken as being the same thing as the atria, and they are not. The auricles are extensions or projections off of each atrium. So if the right atrium is here, this is the right auricle. If the left atrium is here, which it is, this is the left auricle. And these projections just increase the capacity of the right atrium and the left atrium so that they can hold more blood inside of themselves. The first blood vessel that I can see coming out of the right side of the heart is the pulmonary artery and it has a pinkish appearance to it. It's very formed and easy to see. The pulmonary artery is an artery that takes deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. So this is carrying blood that needs to be oxygenated, pulmonary artery, slightly behind it and with a lot of branches to it typically, although ours is a little bit messy in this pig, to be honest, you can see the branching aorta. And so all of this space here where it's a little bit darker, it's not pretty, but this is the aorta of the fetal pig that I'm dissecting. So pulmonary artery, and then right behind it, kind of branching into other blood vessels, 
here we can see some of the other blood vessels, which is kind of cool. Let's isolate those. We have the aorta. Now, I really want to see where the trachea goes into the lungs. So I am going to try to get the heart and the major blood vessels out of here. I can see the trachea and I can see that this tissue, which is pretty much just aorta and its blood vessels above the heart, is not attached to the trachea. So I'm gonna lift this as much as I can, use my finger to separate it, and then trim and make sure the trachea still looks good. It still looks good. And trim again. And the heart's starting to lift out for me. I'm just gonna keep an eye on the trachea and the lungs and make sure I'm not causing any damage there. Um, beneath the heart, there's usually an inferior vena cava. So I'm gonna cut that blood vessel and detach that. And just kind of carefully keep lifting the heart out while trying not to damage any lung tissue. We'll see how this goes. Oh, look, I need to cut pulmonary artery down here. There we go. And the heart's loosening for me as those last blood vessels snip. You can see the back of some of the blood vessels right there. I believe that's where the uh, superior and inferior vena cava would have dumped into the right side of the heart. There's our heart. And now we're able to see a little bit more of the respiratory system than we could see before. We're moving on to the respiratory system. Pigs breathe in their nose and in their mouth like humans do. And as that air travels to the back of the mouth, we have a structure right here that we've talked about already. This flap is known as the epiglottis. Remember, the epiglottis covers up the trachea to make sure that food and water don't go down the trachea when we're eating, and it opens up when we're breathing to make sure air can go down the trachea. Now, in this specific fetal pig, it's really hard to see the difference between the trachea and the esophagus, so we're just gonna focus on the epiglottis right here and know that back here, there probably is an opening to the trachea. I think it's like right around here. Yeah, if I pushed there, I'd go to the lungs. And behind that, we have the esophagus. Okay, I'm gonna pull the thyroid gland officially out because I wanna be able to see where the voice box or the larynx of the pig is. So at the top of the trachea, at the top of our earthworm, you can see that it bulges right up here. Inside this bulge are the vocal cords. So this is the larynx, also known as the voice box. And then the trachea continues down to the lungs where it arrives at the lungs down here. Now it's very difficult to see where the trachea splits, but the trachea will split at some point if we can move even more of this heart tissue into a left and a right side, and with just how much heart tissue is here, it's really hard to see where it splits. But the trachea splits into two bronchi. We have a right bronchi and a left bronchi, and the right bronchi leads to the right lung, and the left bronchi leads to the left lung. And you can see just like the liver, the lungs in our fetal pig have lobes to them. Now, inside the lungs, each bronchi is going to split into smaller and smaller and smaller branches. And then those branches are going to end with alveoli, those little air sacs where we have external respiration happening, oxygen flowing into the blood, CO2 flowing into the lungs or passing into the lungs. If I use a scalpel to make a small snip in one of the lungs, I just want you to see what the inside tissue looks like. It's not hollow, it's completely dense. And you can see there's little teeny tiny openings in it that maybe some larger bronchioles or blood vessels went through, but really our lungs are very dense. They just have all these teeny tiny narrow tubes and air sacs inside of them, the bronchioles and the alveoli.
Now, my fetal pig was just about to be born when it was harvested. So it's going to be a lot more ossified, going to have a lot more bone than a fetal pig that was harvested when it's seven or eight inches long, because this pig is about 16 to 17 inches long. Now, so I'm not going to be able to do this next part because my pig has a pretty hard skull. This is one place where having a smaller fetal pig is a huge advantage. You want, if you have the ability to do this, to use the scalpel to cut a circle right above the eyes and right in front of the ears and right behind the snout on the top of the head, almost like a little cap on their head. And then you'll peel back the skin. And this is why I don't even want to try. It's just dangerous. My scalpel is going to break. But if your pig is softer, you can actually cut straight through the skull and you'll be able to lift the skull back and see the brain tissue. Just a word to the uh, wise, brain tissue is very heavy and very high in adipose tissue, fat tissue. So it's very sensitive and it breaks really easily. The only reason you would want to go and look at the brain is just for the sake of curiosity. Um, you will be able to see probably the left and the right cerebral hemispheres, the gyri and the sulci. Um, but beyond that, you're not going to really be able to identify a lot of the detailed anatomy of the brain just because it is so sensitive. I've even heard some teachers saying when they opened it up, the brain was almost like a goop, that it didn't have much form to it at all. So if you do want to take a look at the nervous system, make sure you're just using your wisest judgment on using the scalpel to cut the skull open because for a lot of pigs, it's not a good idea.